Good morning. How are we? Great to be with you again. My name's R.D., and uh, I am the Young Adults Pastor here at Fellowship Middlebrook and also serve as one of the teaching pastors. And uh, great to be with you opening up God's Word. We'll be in Romans chapter 7 this morning. But before we get there, uh, I want to just say a verse that a lot of us know and we love, and it's from another one of Paul's letters, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And it says this, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old is gone, and the new has come. If anyone is in Christ, he, she, you are a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, the new has come. Now, that is a theological reality. That is true right now. If we've come to faith in Christ, we are new. We're, we're new. And yet, if we were to rewrite that verse like I did this week in terms of our felt reality, how we feel when we look at that verse, uh, it's a lot different. I just rewrote it this week this way. I said, well, here's how I rewrite in my message translation of this verse. It's, I don't feel in Christ. I feel like I'm a sinful mess, not a new creation. The old is alive and well. The new, it's, it's somewhere. I see glimpses of it, but it's certainly not a big part of my life where it wasn't this week or today. Isn't that how we often feel? This, this verse feels more aspirational than it does reality. Uh, and that way, it can sometimes feel crushing. I mean, we uh, feel like there's this Jekyll and Hyde that is living inside of us, right? Dr. Jekyll, the upstanding doctor who creates this potion to drink, so the evil side, the monstrous side, Mr. Hyde, the hideous one, the one who he wants to hide, hence hide, uh, can come out at night. It's two people in one person, and oftentimes we feel that hide side that we want to hide. It, it comes out, right? We make progress in life. Uh, we, we're growing, and then the, the old us comes roaring back, this monster inside of us. We don't feel like a new creation, if we're being honest, right? Me, I'll just use me as an example. Um, I wake up in the morning, I'm reading Philippians 3, re reading the Psalms, and have a peace that passes all understanding. This is going to be a morning, Lord. This is a time. I'm feeling it. Uh, my kids wake up. No, I'm going to be at it. I'm going to be proactive. Yes, I'm not going to respond in anger. This is the time. And then they wake up, and they start fighting, or they spill syrup everywhere. And then I, you know, it's all sticky, or milk goes everywhere. Uh, nothing even major. And I can quickly see the blood pressure rising in that Bible study I had uh, 30 minutes ago. It's gone, and, and I want to just grab my kids and be like, what is wrong with you? Why are you doing this to me? I had a great Bible study, and you messed it up, right? That, that's how I feel about, uh, about this, right? That hindsight, it just uh, comes out, right? We want the fruit of the Spirit. We want to experience the fruit of the Spirit. But oftentimes in our week, in our life, what we experience is the fruit of ourselves, Right? Instead of uh, love, we have the fruit of indifference. Instead of joy, it's joylessness. Instead of peace, it's anxiety. Uh, instead of patience, it's impatience. Instead of kindness, it's coldness. Instead of goodness, it's vileness. Instead of faithfulness, it's faithlessness. Instead of gentleness, it's hardness. Instead of self-control, it is everything is out of control in my heart and in this world. That, that's the fruit that I experience most of the time. And, and we're perhaps somewhere on that continuum, but, continuum, but that is the fruit of my own life. And it's a never-ending war, isn't it? A never-ending war, and there's so many battles, and oftentimes we feel like if we were to look at our week or our month that we're losing the battle to becoming the people that we want to be, that we just can't seem to find the ability to become. And Romans 7 takes us right into the heart of the war, into the battle. It's like a theological Normandy. It shows us from the sky, the theological view, and then it shows us on the ground Right, like through the Higgins boats that come up on the, on the land there in Normandy, it shows us on the ground the, exp the experience of this theology of how we live in this battle, in this war between who we want to be and who we often feel like we are or who we used to be. Romans 7 is going to show us this. And Romans 7, as Greg's you know, said many times about Romans, Paul is responding to arguments and questions that he has gotten. In Romans 7, a big uh, question or, or argument is, is the law that which is bad? The law itself is the problem. 
Uh, the law is the thing that is bringing up all of this evil and all of this wickedness. And Paul is gonna say in Romans 7, no, it's not the law, it's you. It's me. That's the problem. The law shows us who God is. It shows us how we should live. It's the sin that we bring to the law that the law has exposed, which prevents us from obeying it. The law is a mirror that looks up to God and then reflects back to us and says, no, you look nothing like that. You look nothing like it. And Paul says, the law is not what is bad. The law is good. You and I, me, we are the ones. Our sin is what just makes the law be what it is, something that we cannot obey, we cannot follow, right? In verses one through four, chapter seven, Paul says the way to have fruitful obedience is that you have to die to the old husband, the law, that you can never fulfill. And now you have a new husband by grace, by faith, uh, that is Jesus Christ, your new husband. But if you get married or know when you get married, it takes a long time for this new identity of being married to sit in right, to set in. It just takes a long time, and that is true in spiritual life as well. And then Paul goes on in verses 7 through 13, and basically he just says the law's not bad. It exposes what's bad in us. It exposes what's sinful in us. That's what the law does. It's a flashlight into your heart, into the dark parts of your heart, and it sets the standard that we cannot follow. And then there in the middle is verses 5 and 6 where Paul says, so what God does is this law book that he has for us. He writes it on our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So now we have the desire and the ability to follow the lawgiver like we didn't before. So that, that's kind of the theological reality, right? That's the planes in the sky uh, uh, on, on D-Day. But then Paul's gonna say, now I wanna take it down to the ground, the landing. I wanna take you with me as I live this reality out. And so Paul's shifting in verse 14 to the present tense, and I love this because he's gonna describe his reality as a Christian and the struggle he has between the old Paul and the new Paul, between the flesh in Paul and the Christ in Paul. And it also serves as an example for all of us as well in this struggle, in this battle. Because that's the question. Though we're in Christ, we still feel like we're not often. So how does that happen? How do we make sense of that? If Christ has set us free, why do we still feel like slaves? Well, Paul's gonna get into that now. Verse 14 of chapter seven. For we know that the law is spiritual, meaning good, meaning holy. That's verse 12. But I am of the flesh, sold under sin. So Paul here is comparing these realities. Now this is, he's saying all of this is to come after he's converted. This is the testimony of a man who's come to faith in Christ. So it's very relevant to all of us who are watching who are in Christ. Paul says, we know the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. So there are two meanings to the flesh here that Paul has when you see this Greek word most of the time. Number one is the flesh means not, not the physical body, because the physical body, uh, contrary, uh, you know, Gnosticism, is not bad, it's good. Your body is good, it will carry on with you into eternity, but the flesh is the old you, it's the old Paul. It's the Paul before Christ, it's the RD before Christ, it's the old me, that's what the flesh is. And secondly, the flesh also refers to our ability or Paul's desire to still try and please God or earn God's favor through obedience to the law by being a Pharisee. And so the flesh says it's the old you, but it's also the old you trying to become the new you, not by grace, but by works. That's what the flesh is. It's a reality, and then it's a lived reality that we often still live in. It's, it's like if you have... Um, you know, uh, a piece of road that has all of this dirt on it and all these weeds that are growing up on it. And then you, you, you put concrete on it, a new foundation on it. Amazing. All the dirt, all the weeds are gone. But eventually what's gonna happen? Somehow through the cracks in the concrete, uh, the weeds are gonna come up. Though they're buried deep, they're gonna come up. And what Paul is saying is Christ is that, that new foundation that's poured over the old Jew but there's still cracks because we've not been perfected yet where the weeds come up, where the sin comes up, where the flesh comes up. And what we try and do, instead of going to Christ and say, hey, let's get more concrete, we try and get the weed whacker ourselves and, and get rid of it, which we can't really do. We can't do it. 
right? The old us still keeps coming back again and again and again. So here Paul uh, you know, talks about this reality that we have a new identity, being sons and daughters of God, but we still have the same capacity to sin and to fail and to rebel. And so Paul then goes, a famous passage here in Romans, verses, chapter seven, verses 15 through 23. For I do not understand my own actions, which we can just stop there and say, there, that is my life verse. And if you're honest, that should be your life verse as well. Put that on the coffee cup. Put that on my T-shirt. I don't, Paul the Apostle wrote basically the New Testament. He says, I honestly don't know what I'm doing. And so as, as a leader, as a pastor, as a parent, uh, as, as just RG, I feel like I was deeply encouraged by this. I have no idea what I'm doing. So if you're looking for a life verse, it's right, this is it, right? This is it. It's honestly just encouraging. It just is. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. That's how we know he's a Christian, not a non-Christian when he's writing this uh, or talking about his experience because he has the desire, even though he can't carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law, meaning a principle. I find it to be a principle that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members, my body, the rest of me, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members, in my body. Okay, that's a very Pauline way, meaning long and complicated, way of basically saying, I don't do the things that I want to do. I'm not really sure why I don't do the things I know I should do. I kind of know because it's a sin that still lives in me. I want to do it, but I can't. That's what he's saying in a very long Paul way, basically. And so I want to pick out just three things from this, um, from this passage briefly about the nature of sin, uh, which is so important because Romans 7 is going to set us up. Imagine Romans 7 as the last base camp before we get to Mount Everest, which is Romans 8 which is, I think, the peak of all of the Bible, Romans 8. But if we don't look at Romans 7, then we can't soar as much when we get to Romans chapter 8. And so here's a couple things that that we have to get a sense of. Life outside the Spirit of God. What does it look like? Number one, the presence of sin. You see in verses 17 and 20, he talks about the sin that dwells within him. And this is the doctrine of indwelling sin, which the church has affirmed, the Bible affirms, and the church has affirmed for two centuries now, that though you've been made new in Christ, and now the Holy Spirit dwells in you, he is greater than the sin in you. That is true. Greater is he. But there's still indwelling sin in you. Right? God has not got rid of it yet until you see his face one day. The residue of who you used to be remains in in you. It still dwells in you. But now, right now, we have an ability to fight it. That's where the hope comes from. That's what Romans 8 is going to talk about a ton. But if you're wondering, why, why can I not go where I want to go? Why can I do the things that I, that I want to do? Uh, because sin still dwells in you. It's still a part of you. It's not your master now, but uh, it still lives in your house. It's like a squatter. It's just tough to get rid of it. It's not welcome. You don't want it there, but it's really hard to just eliminate it. it. It remains. Its presence remains, and that's what glorification is all about, that one day the presence of sin will be fully eliminated from us and from the world. How amazing. Not even its presence. Only dwelling with God forever in peace, the, the shalom eternally. But not yet. We're not there yet. So uh, secondly, the power of sin. So not only, see, sin uh, is not just this kind of benign presence out there that, that sometimes kind of, uh, you know, makes us do mistakes or makes us do bad things. No, it has a power. The more that you give into it, the more that you rile it up, right? Uh, the, the more that you follow Christ, the more you will follow Christ. The more that you give into sin, the more that you will give into sin. This is a principle. This, this is a law in and of it itself, that there is this power to it, that Paul says that I have the desire to do what I, what I 
want what I know I should do, but I can't do it. I can't carry it out. So that we're morally disabled, right? We're morally crippled, right? Our ability to follow God as we should, it's been bent. It's been, um, it's been broken still by the fall, still by the way that the world is. So sin is not only missing the mark, it's a power that enslaves us. And the flesh is stirred up also by our great enemy, Satan, who wants to take right the, this old us and just keep saying, that is who you are. Yep, that's who you are. See, you're not even growing. Nothing's happening. And he just uses this to just chain us more and more. He just comes in there and just accuses us. That's what he does. He's a liar and an accuser. Thirdly, uh, there's a war between sin and the spirit. I mean, and it is a war. There's a battle going on in your heart. We know who the victor will be in the end. We know it. But it doesn't mean they're not gonna be losses sometimes. They're gonna be victories as well. But you're gonna experience a lot of losses still. At the end here, Paul says, um, I see in my body this war between the law of sin and death and another law, the, the law of my mind that I want to follow. And there's a battle going on. All the time there's this battle in me but who I want to be and who sometimes I feel like I still am this old me. And how true is that? Doesn't that make sense of the world that we walk in, our own hearts, right? That's what Paul is saying here, on the ground, what it looks like. So sin is, um, it's a power over us. It's a presence that is all around us and it still resides to some level in us. And it's at war with us 24 seven, psychologically, uh, emotionally, and spiritually. And we feel the oppression of that sometimes, right? We feel the burden of that. We feel the guilt sometimes uh, of that. And we just feel it. And then talking about it, I think we're probably, you're probably feeling some weight right now. And so how does Paul respond to this? As only Paul, Paul can. Verse 24. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I mean, that, that is the natural response. When he's walking through, he's saying, I can't do what I want. I can't follow Christ like I should. Sin is attacking me. It's, uh, it's all around me. I, I'm a wretched man. That, that's the problem, right? I, I'm still bent inwardly. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Who will do then. So what Paul does here in this one verse is, is many things. We'll just pick out a couple. Number one is he correctly diagnoses what the ultimate problem is in his life and what it is in my life and your life. It's you. It's you. Look, your circumstances in your life can play a major factor in determining a lot about you. Uh, your family history can play a lot of factors in your life and what you're disposed to and what you're not. Uh, so many things in your life can contribute in many ways to you following Christ or not. So I am not discounting that at all, at all. But there is no one who is a greater enemy to your joy, to your holiness, and to your obedience than you. No one. And if we, if we shift the blame away to other people only, we'll have all the wrong solutions. If we don't see in ourselves that we are wretches, then we're not gonna look where we should for the solution, for the answer. And so Paul diagnoses the problem. It's gonna be obviously controversial, of course. And then he says, well, who's gonna deliver me? If that's the diagnosis that, that I'm bent, that I'm still an Adam uh, to some level, Right, that Adam's still in me more accurately. He still kind of rears its head up sometimes. Oh, well, the religious answer is this, uh, that the law, to obey the law, you will be free, right? Obey the law and you will be free. This is the Pharisees, this is Buddhism, this is Hinduism, this is Islam, this is Southern religion, right? In many different ways, but at the end of the day, the, the, what they say is, yeah, you are a wretch. And the answer is to follow the law, to follow the rules so that you can morally clean your life up and approach God. And then he will accept you, right? That, that is all that that teaches, right? Religion just says, be a good person, follow the rules. It's not about abiding. It's about striving. It, it's about, um, you know, earning, getting, but it never goes deep enough, right? You have Paul. I mean, Paul knew the whole Old Testament. Paul knew the law by heart. 
But he didn't know the law in his heart. And he didn't know the lawgiver um, who wanted his heart. Not until God just came and blew him up, obviously, <laughs> and just changed his life. He didn't know. Right, and what often happens when, when, when you're, when you, whatever the law is, whatever the rules are, whatever the control is in your life, when that becomes your center of dependence, that's really you. You're the center of dependence. It's a means of self-salvation. And what it does is it creates more guilt and more shame over time because you realize eventually I cannot climb the mountain enough to please God or to feel good about myself. You know, what religion does is it says you are rich and it... It promises that if you do these things, you won't feel like that. But at the end of the day, what happens? You feel even worse. I'm going to press this a little further because I would imagine, you know, you're thinking, yes, 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 Southern religion. I escaped that, thankfully. Um, you know, those other religions, those, yeah, follow the laws, but I, I, am, I follow grace. I am in the gospel. Are you? Are you? I still think a natural default of our heart is God loves us to the degree that we obey him. That God accepts you to the degree this week you didn't sin and you did the right things. Right, it still lives in us, this ladder of acceptance. Even if you've been at Fellowship Church and you have heard the gospel for years, amazingly taught, a culture of the gospel we want to have here, there's still something in us that when we look at our lives and our weeks, we say, I really don't think deep down that God loves me and accepts me because look at what I'm walking through. That is trying to get your justification through your obedience. It's self-salvation, right? That's what it is. And all of us do it. And so the other way is then, right, so that, that is um, the uh, kind of uh, the elder brother prodigal. And then we have the younger brother prodigal who just leaves all religion behind, which is very much in our culture and our, our way uh, now, right? The modern, postmodern answer is don't, don't obey the law, obey your heart to be free. Your heart is the guide. Your heart is the true north. That's what matters most. Christianity, of course not. That is restrictive. That is not gonna help you be free. There are all these rules. No, you have to follow you. That is what is most important. Not feel like a wretch. And so what irreligion does, to just use a word, what irreligion does is it says, not you're a wretch, but you're good. You are good. Don't think you're not. Believe you are good no matter what. How do I know this? Well, there's a great theologian uh, from, I think, Norway, uh, from the city of Arendelle, she said this. She said, it's funny how some distance makes everything seem small. And the fears that once controlled me can't get to me at all. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. I'm free, no right, no wrong, just let it go, just let it be, I'm free, I'm the captain, I'm in charge. But man, that's not freedom, that's slavery to yourself. Because it puts all the weight on you, achieving the joy in your life. So you say, okay, well that's, that's you know, I don't do Disney, right, I, that is, you know, no, 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 let, that is not how it used to be. Okay, well let's go to another example of another song just for you that want to follow along with singing, uh, to Mother Superior, who I don't think anyone would say is a radical liberal, okay, from the sound of music. This is what she, she said. Climb every mountain, ford every stream, follow every rainbow till you find your dream. What absolute nonsense. <laughs> right? I mean, I love the sound of music. Love it, love the movie, it is a musical, right? And you say, well, I don't actually believe that, but so much of how we think is, I'm, if I could just do it, if I could get my dreams achieved, I'll be free, and you won't be. You won't be. It doesn't matter where you look because the center of dependence is still, again, it's you. It's you achieving it. You're your own law giver and law keeper, even though you can't keep it yourself. You can't do it. So Paul says, neither religion 
or irreligion is the answer. Neither one of those can ultimately save you. There may be some things that you do in that that are helpful for a season. I will grant you that. But deep change happens deeply within us from someone who comes outside of us to invade our heart and remake it from a heart of stone to a heart of new flesh. Who is that? Verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Romans chapter eight. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life, really the gospel, the Holy Spirit, has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Amen. How, how much more glorious is Romans 8, 1 when you've seen all that's come before? There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? Man, do I believe that? Not all the time. I'll, I don't. But what Paul is saying, Paul, he had plenty of dark stuff in his life. He can write it. He can say it. We have full exoneration because we're in Christ. We're not guilty. We have been exonerated by the God of the universe. This war inside of us, these sins that rage inside of us, no, fully exonerated, past, present, and future when we are placed in Christ by the Holy Spirit. But not only do we have exoneration and we're declared not guilty, we have liberation. We have an ability to live out being free, right? And it just hints at it in, in chapter, uh, in verse two here. Paul says, the law of the spirit has set you free from the law of sin and death. So there's even a greater law, and that's the law of the Holy Spirit. That's the gospel that comes in and changes our heart. So now we have an ability and a power to follow God and follow Christ, not perfectly, but we're no longer dead. And we no longer have to live in guilt or shame about our sin. We can live in hope. We can look forward to what he's, he's done. So how do we live in that liberation? A couple of things as we uh, wrap up here. Well, well, Romans 8, I could just read Romans 8, and we're going to spend several weeks in over the, the weeks to come, thankfully. I mean, just live in Romans 8, that's basically the answer. But I also want to just throw out uh, three things uh, as well that, that are hinted at in this passage and also when you look at the Bible. Uh, there are many things, but I'm just gonna pick out uh, three uh, this morning. H how do we live out this liberation? Three words, fight, behold, and walk. Fight, behold, walk. Number one, fight sin. This is a war and you have to know it's a war. You have to know the reality that you are in a war. Though it may look beautiful outside, though everything may, you know, may look wonderful outside, there is a reality of spiritual darkness in the world that is waging war against your soul, against your joy, against your obedience, um, and against everyone you know. We have to know we're in, we're in a war. We have to know it, right? Otherwise, we can't fight well. We're gonna be fighting blindly. We have to size up the enemy uh, our old selves and Satan for what they are. And also, of course, for who Christ is. John Owen, one of the great Puritans, wrote in his book called The Mortification of Sin. The mortification is a word that just means to put to death, to kill. Uh, so to mortify something is to kill it. It's a great book on how to fight sin. Uh, here's a quote. He says this. He says, let no man think to kill sin with few easy or gentle strokes. He who hath once smitten a serpent, if he follow not on his blow until it be slain, may repent that he ever began the quarrel. And so he who undertakes to deal with sin must pursue it constantly to the death. Do you mortify? Do you make it your daily work to be always at it while you live? Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin, or it will be killing you. Be killing sin, or it will be killing you. You cannot take any time off. You have to be always on the offensive. And you know what? What the gospel allows us to do is to get down to the why of our sin. Everything else just lands at the what. It says, what are you angry about? What are you trying to control? Uh, what are you impatient about? Fix that. Fix the what. Let's not really go to the why, not deeply, but the gospel gives us an ability to say, actually, let's get to the why. Why are you angry? 
I mean, why are you impatient? Why do I get impatient with my kids and with my wife? Because I want life to be about me. That's why. I love what my wife said the other night on the table talking about parenting. She said this, she said, um, I don't need more patience. I need more Jesus. Now I'll preach. You can tweet that, right? That is what I'm talking about. You don't just need, the way you get the fruit of the Spirit is by the Holy Spirit. Not by focusing on the fruit, but getting to the root. By fighting sin where it is, by putting it to death, because you can, you can face the wise, because you know God accepts you. So you're on the offense, you're fighting. That's what you are doing. And just remember, we're not just fighting against flesh and blood, so we need desperate prayer, the word of God, and healthy, real community, which is a whole other sermon. But remember, Paul is writing this book to the Romans, to the church in Rome, not just to one guy. And saying, figure this out on your own. He's saying, no, you're doing this together. You need each other to encourage each other, to love each other, to call out the glorious in each other and not the shame in each other of how you're falling and failing. We fight sin not by focusing on the sin in front of us, but by focusing on Christ. And that's number two, beholding Christ. Beholding him, beholding the glory of Christ in the gospel by living in Romans 8, who he is, what he's done, right? Religion says you're, you're a wretch, right? And so try and clean up your life, but you're still gonna feel like a wretch. And the gospel says, no, you're more of a wretch than you ever knew. And then irreligion says, but you're good, you're good, you're good. Don't worry about it. And yet the gospel comes in and says, no, no, no. You can know a goodness beyond every, anything you've ever experienced through the goodness of God coming into your life. It answers both of these things. When we behold Christ and I, I honestly believe this, so much of our failing to love Christ comes from us not being loved by him and receiving his love and living in his love and walking in the spirit. Abiding is better than striving. Being near him, being with him is so important to behold him, to look um, to, look to him, to just sit and let his love change you. And that may not happen immediately, but it will happen. It can happen when you behold your Savior and not just look at your sin. Fighting sin happens when you behold the love of Jesus. Well, number three, keep walking. You know, Winston Churchill, he famously said, if you're, walking, if you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> keep walking. Here's the deal. You're gonna fight sin every day, uh, probably take some days off. I know sometimes I do. I'm just not thinking about it. I get tired. Uh, I want to behold Christ. I don't always. I mean, not at all. But the point is you're gonna keep walking, keep going, right? You're gonna fail. You're gonna fall. You're gonna mess up. The, the old you is gonna rear its head from time to time. Those weeds are gonna come up. Right? You're gonna fail, right? The, uh, the sign that you're growing in Christ is not necessarily that you're sinning less, but that you're repenting more. Right, because as you grow in Christ, God may show things in your life you never even knew were there. Oh my gosh, it's even worse than I thought. And that will crush you unless you see it as a gift of his grace to expose things in your life you never knew so you can experience a love you never knew. He doesn't want you to hide anything or leave anything away. He says, give, give all of it. Come all the way home, keep walking. I'm going to bring up stuff you never knew was there. But we fall when we walk, don't we? I've got a video. Instead of just telling you this, I want to show you a video of my daughter, Leela, learning how to walk. Because to me, all the books, all the theology, all the Puritans, all the, this is the best visual example of what sanctification, walking with Christ, looks like. And so we have a video that I want to show of her. Come here. Yeah, focus. <laughs> you got it. Wow. <laughs> I mean, isn't that it? <laughs> Just walking and falling. And what, and what would be uh, uh, unhealthy response, right, is, is to say to, to Leela, that's it? That, that's all the walking? 
That you just fell most of the time. And so often we look at God and we think that's how he thinks about us is you fell. But what God is doing is he's saying, you're walking. You're walking, right? That's what's happening. You are walking. I'm so proud of you. I love you. You are walking. And of course you're falling, but let the default of your heart be God is celebrating over you, not condemning you. And that's the way you're gonna fight sin. That's the way you're gonna fight this battle. Right, Christ didn't save you to leave you. And he's not only after your your salvation, he's after your transformation. He who began a good work will complete it. And the way he does that is by reminding you of who you are and who he is in you. I'll close with this. There's a, uh, uh, if you know the movie Hook, it's a great, it's a great movie. Uh, I watched it growing up. And briefly, it kind of reimagines the Peter Pan story where Robin Williams is, Peter, he was Peter Pan growing up. Now he's become Peter Banning. Uh, and he left Neverland. And now he has a family. He's a business guy. He's too busy for everything. He doesn't go to his kids' baseball games, right? He just totally has forgotten who he is and, and what, he's, what he's done. Now he's just this big tech guy. And, um, in the movie, uh, he ends up having to go to Neverland because Captain Hook, his great enemy, kidnaps his kids. And so he goes to Neverland through uh, Tinkerbell. He shows up on this boat with Captain, you know, Hook. Dustin Hoffman is Hook, who was great. You know, Peter, just amazing. And he shows up in this tuxedo because that's what he was wearing when he left his house. And he tries to bargain with Hook and says, I'll write you a check for them. Just give them back to me. And Hook is like, who, who are you? This is not Peter Pan. This is not. You're a shell of who you used to be. Peter Banning, who is this? I want my old adversary, Peter Pan. And so he keeps the kids, right? Hook does. And so uh, Robin Williams, Peter Banning goes to be with the Lost Boys and, and just he's anxious. He can't fly. He's supposed to fly because he's Peter Pan. He has no idea how to get his kids back because he's forgotten who he is. And there's this great scene in the movie where no doubt this young African-American boy, one of the Lost Boys, here's a great um, clip of it or picture of it. He starts examining Robin Williams' face and he's just poking it and prodding it and all of that. And he finally peels back, you know, his uh, cheeks some. He looks deep into his eyes and he simply says this. He says, there you are, Peter. There you are. And from that moment on, Peter, began, Peter Banning remembers he truly is Peter Pan. And he can fly. And he can face his enemy hook. And he can get his kids back. He learns and falls along the way, but he, all it took was a young boy calling out deep inside of him who he truly was. And that's what God does for us. There you are, R.D. There you are. There you are. Let's bring that out. Let's become who you already are so you can fight the enemy. So you can live in my power. If anyone is in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, the new is here. Let's fight. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that the battle ultimately is not ours, it is yours. That it is not our fight, it is your fight in us. And yet you still call us to fight and to engage and not to be lazy, and not to be apathetic, and not to live in shame, but to live in power, to live in victory of what you've done for us. I'm thankful, so thankful for Romans 7 that says to the reality of my heart, there's a reason you still fall and fail, just like Leela, is because you're growing and you're learning to walk into who you truly are. Father, help us be a church. Help us be people in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a quarantine where so much is happening, where maybe old sins have come back like never before. Doubts come into our life. Would your word and your truth be a better word than our flesh, than Satan? Help us remember, Lord, you say into our hearts, there you are so we can fly and we can fight and we can fall down and still know you are singing over us, coming out to greet us and bring us home. 
until we see your face, Lord, and we become like you. We love you. Yet not I, but through Christ.